the main character in Octavia Butler's dystopic novels, The Parable of the Sower and The Parable of the Talents, Lauren Olamina, is suffering from a condition she calls hyper-empathy syndrome. She basically always feels what others um, around her feel, often with very painful and distressing consequences for her. Butler's two science fiction novels never clearly decide if it's considering Lauren's condition to be a burden, a disability, a gift, a delusion, or a superpower. I'm often wondering if we have to become burdened collectively with Lauren's hyper-empathy syndrome to successfully arrive at a new intersectionally aware space of togetherness where everybody can find a place to belong. How can we finally assemble better worlds that accommodate all kinds of different bodies that often fall outside the norms given by institutionalized environments? We are all socialized uh, within those hegemonic structures of oppression um, that shape our understanding of the world and our access to material resources and opportunities. This often unacknowledged societal, ideological, um, hegemonic fills, how I would call it, um, rooted in white supremacy, cis heteropatriarchy, uh, class exploitation and racial capitalism makes it often difficult to craft political communities constituted by heterogeneity and variety rather than homogeneity and fixity. Needless to say, the ongoing debate about the divisiveness of um, identity politics and popular media and the distorted use of the term first developed by Barbara Smith and the Kombuhi River Collective are quite astounding to me. Um, it seems to receive more and more attention in the German-speaking media, um, at least, to articulate that those intellectual, activist and self-affirming tools we are developing to make better sense about structures of oppression are divisive, than to have an informed debate about how those structural dimensions of oppression and privilege are a. intersectionally entangled and b. continue to divide us. It is not a matter of if we are or if we are not racist, heterosexist, transphobic and ableist, but how white supremacy, cis heteropatriarchy and racial capitalism shape our perception about the world, about the past and about the institutional realities we have inherited to keep those structures of oppression in place, in unacknowledged, but also in very direct and forceful ways. It seems so far to be a connecting argument for many speakers participating in the episode Radical Solidarity, that solidarity indeed has to be an uneasy, reserved and unsettled matter that neither reconciles present grievances nor forecloses future conflicts. Solidarity means standing alongside with people even when you have not personally experienced their oppression and probably won't ever fully understand what a certain minoritized group is going through. I'm often wondering about the politics who actually ask for more solidarity and dialogue um, and who needs conflict, differences and anger as a legitimate emotion to the experience of inequality to find acceptance. Terms like dialogue, community, coalition, solidarity and so on um, sound great on paper and are necessary, but they can also quickly become technologies for silencing liberation movements because minority discourses are so often framed as divisive and as too particular, most often in moments when an unacknowledged majoritarian positionality is not reflected on, but continues to speak from a universalizing default position that often comes along with an attitude like Let's put all those negative feelings to the side um, so we can just get along and fight under shared banner of a universal struggle. Yeah, Good for you, um, I guess. But this won't do anymore. There cannot be a getting along when an unacknowledged racism and or heterosexism and or classism continue to dehumanize people. So is a collective hyper-empathy syndrome um, our way out? Um, I doubt that. But it can maybe remind us as a conceptual idea that radical solidarity um, has to hurt and has to make many, in particular those from more privileged backgrounds, feel uncomfortable because we need to continue to put pressure onto those hegemonic institutionalized structure that in fact support and care for only a small group of people. 
Black feminist intellectual thought has taught us that we cannot leave anybody behind and we need mass movements with the confidence to challenge the violent lie that this society, as it is currently built, is the best that we hope to achieve.